Well, thank you and uh, good morning. Um, I'm um, until recently was a member of the European Parliament uh, representing the northeast of England. And while I was a member of the Parliament, I was on uh, the Environment Committee of the Parliament and on the Agriculture Committee of the Parliament. And they're the two committees that have the most to do with forestry issues and with wood issues. And um, on behalf of my political group, I picked up responsibility for those areas, forestry and wood, and developed um, a fairly good knowledge, I think. And that's why uh, when finishing as a member of the parliament, um, I've gone on to work for uh, CIBWA, which is the European Confederation of Woodworking Industries, and also for EOS, which is the European Organization of the sawmill industry. And I'm speaking to you from the northeast of England, um, very close to the River Tyne. And the Tyne has a strong trading relationship with the Baltic. Uh, this is um, one of our older buildings on the River Tyne, the Baltic Flour Mill, which is no longer a flour mill, but has become um, an art center. But the, the lettering on the building and the building's name, which is the Baltic, now it's an art center, um, reminds us in the northeast of England of our trading links uh, with, with the Baltic historically. Um, I'm going to begin with just setting a little bit of context. Um, and it's worth reminding ourselves that the um, sustainable development goals of uh, the United Nations, which the world has signed up to, um, have a relevance here because we have at number 13, uh, the need for climate action. And uh, we also have um, at number five, the need to have, sorry, not at number five, at number uh, 11, uh, sustainable cities and communities. Um, and they, sustainable development goals build on the Millennium Development Goals, which came into being uh, in 2000, so just over 20 years ago, and collectively at a global level, uh, we're working towards um, meeting all of these targets. Um, and I think it's fair to say that uh, because these were set 20, 21 years ago, uh, the importance of climate action has only increased uh, during this period. And while we're um, globally um, very focused on the COVID situation, um, I think we're all aware that um, in the background is the even bigger problem of climate change. And to some extent, and understandably, uh, that focus on climate change um, has been lost, if you like, recently. Um, one of the things I think we need to remind ourselves is when we're talking about the built environment at a European level, but also at a global level in particular, is that the population of the world continues to expand. If we take a country like Egypt, this is where this picture is taken, is they currently have a population of 100 million and they will have a population of 160 million by 2050. So in 30 years time, they will have an increase of an extra 60 million, 60 million people. Where are these people going to live? How are we going to make the buildings in which they live? And India has um, exactly the same population trajectory. They currently have a population of 1 billion um, and they will have a population of 1.6 billion in 30 years time. So a huge increase in population is happening in many countries around the world. Where are these people going to live and out of what materials are we going to make the buildings they live in? At a European level, um, if you like, it's a little bit more complicated uh, because there are countries in Europe where the population is standing still. Um, so countries like France and Germany are not experiencing particularly an increase in population. But uh, how, how we live and how long we live is changing. So people are living longer. So that still means there's to some extent an increase in the need for housing. And people are living in smaller family units. So again, that drives uh, an increase in the need for accommodation for housing. And it may well be that uh, the uh, 
the United Nations Conference on Climate Change scheduled for November of this year, which has been already delayed one full year, um, will help us to refocus minds in relation to climate change. And certainly from the world of wood, we're hoping to, to be there um, and to have um, an exhibition which promotes the advantages of using sustainable timber in construction in helping to address uh, climate change. So that's a little bit of context and background. Um, as you know, I'm going to talk about three specific policy areas which are coming out of the European Union, which increase the potential for the use of wood in construction. Uh, the three areas are the European Green Deal, the renovation wave and the new European bar house. Um, so what, what I'm arguing or proposing in my contribution this morning is that there are things that we would like to see happen in the world of wood and the use of wood, of, use of wood particularly in construction, which are helped by these European policies. So by talking and linking what we want to do anyway to these European policies, we increase the possibility of being successful in what we want to do. The expression that you may be familiar with of going with the grain, um, this is the grain, if you like, from the European Union. This is the direction of travel. And, and if we can fit within that direction of travel, the things that we would like to do anyway, then we've got a greater chance of succeeding with them at a European level. So we'll look first at the European Green Deal. This is probably the one we'll look in most detail at. Now, the European Green Deal is Europe's intention of becoming the first climate neutral continent in the world by 2050. If you like, it's the European Union's sustainable growth strategy. And you can see there's various policy areas there. And I'd like to go through a few of these, or most of these, just to show you how the world of wood can contribute to helping the European Union to deliver in these areas. So from a construction point of view and building with wood, the one which obviously stands out um, is building and renovating in an energy and resource efficient way. So how is it that by using wood, we can build and renovate in an energy and resource efficient way? Now, the president of the commission has pointed out quite rightly, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, that our buildings generate 40% of our emissions and they need to become less wasteful, less expensive and more sustainable. And you can break that 40% figure down with three quarters of it being the energy that is needed to run our buildings. And the other quarter making up the 40% is the construction materials that we use. And we know that steel and concrete in particular are high energy materials and high emission materials to use in construction. So substituting them with wood where appropriate, where appropriate uh, can make a considerable difference uh, to our level of emissions. And we're familiar, or many people are certainly familiar with the fact that historically, um, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, we've built one and two story buildings, particularly homes for people out of wood, wooden frame buildings. So in Canada, the United States, Scandinavia, Scotland, many countries have a tradition of building one and two story buildings with wood. Um, what is different and what is new in the last 10, 15 years is the ability to build at height and at scale with wood in construction due to the emergence of what are to all intents and purposes new materials such as cross laminated timber, uh, glue lamb, laminated veneered timber, etc. And we're able to do really quite extraordinary things now with wood. Um, I think this is a particularly good example of just how much we can now stretch what we're able to do with wood. Uh, this, this is um, a distillery in Scotland, um, Vihag Timber Construction from Austria, or the people who've assembled it. Um, 
and you can see it really is quite an amazing structure mimicking the hills behind um, and inside absolutely fantastic uh, wooden ceiling um, above the distillery equipment. And all around the world, uh, we're seeing the possibilities uh, of building in wood, particularly this at scale and at height. So in the top left picture, you've got uh, Brook Commons in Vancouver in Canada uh, for a period of time until very recently, this was the tallest wooden building in the world made from prefabricated CLT units delivered to site, uh, student accommodation. The middle at the top is the building in the world which has the most CLT cross laminated timber within it, which is a building Dalston Works in Hackney in London by the architects Woff Thistleton. Top right is now the tallest wooden building in the world, um, having pipped um, the building in Canada. It has the same number of stories, 18, uh, but due to a, a clever piece of design work at the very top of the building, um, it is now taller than the building in Canada. And that extra piece of timber on the top of the building um, has meant that it will also be taller than the bottom left building, which is um, in Austria, uh, the Hoho building in Vienna, which although it will have at its highest point 24 stories, it will actually still be slightly smaller, ever so slightly smaller than the one in Norway, which for the foreseeable future is going to remain the world's tallest building wooden building. Um, and in the bottom right uh, is a planned extension to the Bundestag Parliament um, in Berlin, um, which is going to be made from wood, which is a, an office complex. And a, not a week goes by without the announcement of somewhere in the world, a major new uh, wooden building. So we're able to make um, a contribution there um, in relation to the Green Deal, as we seek to deliver buildings which are um, more energy and resource efficient as a, as a result of using wood uh, is the primary uh, product in their, in their construction. But also the Green Deal is hoping to mobilize industry for a cleaner and circular economy. And here comes the prefabrication, um, the off-site construction. Um, I've had the, the privilege to, to visit some of these operations in various parts uh, in Europe. And the best way of thinking about them really is, is that they are assembly plants and they're more like um, a car assembly plant than they are like a construction site. Uh, so there's uh, in, to varying degrees uh, automation being deployed, but the key thing is that they're indoors which means uh, they can operate 24 hours a day, irrespective of the weather, if that's what's decided. Um, one of the things which I found interesting, which you'll see, or maybe can see in the bottom left picture, is that certainly in the United Kingdom, uh, construction sites, outdoor construction sites with people working on them, it's very unusual to see a woman working on a construction site in the UK. I think that's fairly typical of Europe in general. But because this is factory construction and there is more of a tradition of women working in factories, uh, there is a tendency for there to be a larger number. Well, there ten, a tendency for women to be employed in prefabricated timber frame house construction off site, whereas that doesn't occur on uh, actual building sites. So all sorts of little other benefits coming from uh, building off site in wood. So here you can see sort of timber frame construction and then uh, delivery to site, which can either be as units or as um, flat pack. Uh, but the working in the factory setting results in uh, uh, fewer, fewer reduced emissions. Uh, it's cleaner, it's cheaper. There's less waste going to landfill than you would get from uh, a construction site. And the prefabrication process, if you like, can accentuate the uh, wood industry's ability to be um, a circular economy with virtually, or you could argue, no waste within the process. And the prefabricated offsite construction um, is assisting that and making sure that as much wood as possible um, is used in the construction process. So there's another tick in another of the Green Deal boxes as a result of uh, 
the prefabricated offsite construction, which is helping to deliver um, that uh, demand, if you like, of the Green Deal, which is to mobilize industry for a, glee, a clean and circular economy. Um, this is another interesting uh, area where wood has something to contribute, wood construction, where we have two areas of the Green Deal. One is a, a zero pollution ambition for a toxic free environment. And secondly, accelerating the shift to sustainable and smarter mobility. And at first glance, you would think, well, how does wood construction uh, help play into having a toxic free environment? Well, we all know that uh, vehicles, diesel and petrol vehicles are a, a major cause of emissions, um, both in relation to climate change, but also in relation to air quality. So in major cities like London, the air quality is really surprisingly poor, um, depending on certain um, weather conditions. And there are four particles in particular, which are found in polluted air. And one of those particles comes from tiny, tiny pieces of rubber from vehicle tires. So obviously after a while of driving a car, you need to have new tires. Uh, the rubber hasn't disappeared, I'm afraid. The rubber has broken off in tiny pieces and gone into the atmosphere. And I'm um, afraid, unfortunately, people can breathe that in. And in particular, it's the rubber from heavy goods vehicles. Now, one of the things about cement is, is, is an ex, it is an extremely heavy material and it involves many deliveries to the construction site of the cement. And as a result, it's a major contributor to air pollution. So not just to climate emissions, but also to um, damaging the air which we breathe. And bottom left, a delivery of wood to site. Well, wood is nine, 10 times lighter than concrete. And as a result, not surprisingly, you have nine to 10 times fewer deliveries of the material to site. So a wood construction site has nine to 10 times fewer deliveries of heavy goods vehicles. And if you scale that up at a city level, at a country level, at a global level, you begin to realize how significant a contribution we can make from the construction industry by using wood, which is a much, much lighter material. And there you can see it being um, put into place um, on one of the construction sites. I think that is the Hoho building in Austria. Um, so it's also a faster way of um, building and uh, estimates from different um, comparisons made is that it's maybe around about 25% quicker to build, to erect a building made from wood, particularly if it's prefabricated. And in the bottom left picture where the wood delivery to site is taking place, you can see just to the left, the crane. One of the biggest costs on a building site is the hire of a crane uh, to move materials around the site. So if you can make your bill happen in a 25% quicker time frame, then you're taking 25% off your crane bill because it isn't on site as longer. So another benefit for building in wood there. And going on through other aims of the Green Deal, we also have preserving and restoring the ecosystem and biodiversity. Uh, forests, particularly conifer forests producing softwood, um, certainly in the UK, um, have a, a, a reputation, which I think is an undeserved reputation of not having a particularly high level of biodiversity. Um, a recent report from CONFOR in the UK set out to disprove that and pointed out that there are relatively high levels of biodiversity in commercial forests. And that won't just be in the UK, um, that's the case um, across Europe and beyond, is that there is, particularly if the forests are well managed, a high level of biodiversity to be found. And there's a beautiful red squirrel um, on the picture there. And one of the, the red squirrel in the UK has traditionally been pushed out by the arrival of the gray squirrel, um, a competitor, and it's managing to hang on in the northeast of England where I live and in Scotland, and it's doing so particularly within conifer forests. 
Um, so providing some significant habitat in this case for the red squirrel. And uh, then another area to look at, again, this is all within the Green Deal, uh, talk of from farm to fork, a fair, healthy and environmentally friendly farming system. Now the European farming system um, administered under the common agricultural policy has been heavily criticized for many years um, at an environmental level. And if you go back um, over a hundred years, uh, you would have seen a really very different situation um, at a land use level across Europe, because a big difference from then to now is that farming and farming and forestry have gone in separate and different directions, whereas a hundred years ago, they were much more integrated. So land use was a mix of farming and forestry pretty much everywhere you went. Um, and possibly with the exception of Scandinavia, um, but increasingly, um, particularly under the common agricultural policy, we've had farms that produce food and we have forests, which are a separate entity, which produce wood. And there's an increasing realization that if we would like to see an increase in biodiversity on farms, which is the big demand, is we need to put more trees back onto farms. So trees going back onto farms for mutual benefit to both food and livestock production. And climate change is part of what is necessitating and driving this. So if you look at the top left picture, you see um, a cereal crop being produced with strips of trees in between. And the reason the trees have been planted is primarily to provide shade. So this is a cereal crop growing in Southern Europe. The temperatures, particularly in the summer, are rising. And as a result, when it gets too hot in the summer, the cereal crops stop growing. So yields are going down because the temperature is going up. So providing shade from the trees means the crop will continue to grow and you'll get a higher yield than you would have done without the trees. But the trees are also giving you potentially, depending on what kind of tree it is, but could be giving you timber for the future. And this mixing of trees with agricultural production is known as agroforestry. And if you look at the top right picture, you see the largest agroforestry holding in Germany, which is in a place called Cottabus in East Germany, where you've got strips of willow being grown with the cereal crops. Now, again, there's some advantage with shade, but the willow is primarily being grown as an energy crop. Um, and the issue of biofuels, um, there's a certain degree of contention around that, but we in the wood industry recognize that we have a green energy material here and there's going to be a role for wood as an energy supply for many years as we transition uh, in relation to tackling climate change. Um, but yes, it can come from the forest, but it can also come from the farm. And by taking a crop such as willow and mixing it in an agroforestry setting with animals or with crops has many advantages. You'll see some sheep there in the bottom picture um, in the middle. And uh, it turns out some recent research in the UK shows that sheep that feed on willow leaves or have access to grazing on willow leaves produce lower levels of emissions, which is methane, which is a particularly problematic um, gas in relation to climate change. So um, there's something to consider there. And willow, which I've talked about quite a bit in the last uh, couple of minutes, is second only to oak in biodiversity, which is a quite extraordinary um, comment in a way. And the reason for that is because it flowers annually and therefore it's great for pollinators. So you can increase the biodiversity on your farm by planting willow, um, which is something that we need to do. Um, and at the same time, you're producing um, an energy crop, which means that uh, we can diversify the production of um, bioenergy because it can come from the farm um, and from the forest. So there's lots of um, win-wins to be gained from putting more trees onto farms. Um, and that could include fast growing poplar so that you could have a rotation of seven years to produce a timber, which could still make a plywood 
um, and not necessarily having to be grown in a forest for uh, 30, 40, 50 years. So some advantages there. Um, and the clean, affordable and secure energy, which the Green Deal needs, um, is being produced in part, as we said earlier, um, from uh, that circular economy, which we have within uh, the wood industry. Um, so to summarize, uh, the Green Deal sees, um, intends to increase the EU's climate ambition. And I think we can see how it is, as we've talked through the different headings, how it is that uh, wood and the growing of timber um, can help uh, deliver that, particularly the use of wood in construction. So um, increasing the height and scale of wooden buildings, uh, which means we can increase the densification of our, our cities um, rather than see them expanding and taking up valuable um, land, which can be used for either forest or for farming or for recreation. The prefabrication opportunities, the opportunities which come from working with um, a lighter material, uh, that the biodiversity of our forests is higher than many would think, certainly many of our critics would acknowledge, uh, that more trees on farms have win-win benefits, and that uh, between the forest and the farm we can go on supplying that 7% of EU energy which comes from um, biomass. So lots of advantages that the Green Deal delivers and lots of advantages we would be wise to work with. We would be wise to work with. The second area which I will look at, not quite in as much detail, is the renovation wave. Um, the renovation wave was announced by the European Commission in October of last year. So it's a, a relatively new policy. And the renovation wave for Europe to give it its full title, the renovation way for Europe is greening our buildings, creating jobs and improving lives. Greening our buildings, so obviously opportunity for us there, creating jobs, there's a lot of jobs to be had um, in the world of wood and forestry and improving lives because um, we can help deliver that in, in many ways and I'll touch on some of them now. Um, what the renovation wave is primarily endeavoring to do is to reduce energy consumption. So the energy we use to heat our homes and to heat our workplaces, particularly in the winter months, um, is the biggest single cause of climate change emissions at a European level. So we need to make our homes more energy efficient. Um, the sad thing here is we've known about this for many, many years. Uh, we know we've been able to build energy efficient homes and yet all across Europe we go on building homes. So today there will be the keys handed over to new homes, brand new homes, which are not energy efficient. And that's allowed under law and the house builders go on building all over Europe houses which are energy inefficient and will need to be renovated despite the fact that they're brand new, which is shocking really, but that's the state of affairs we're in. Um, and if you have one of these homes, whether it's a new home or an old home and it's energy efficient, you end up spending quite a high percentage of your income on heating the home in the winter months. And the poorer you are, the lower your income, then the more you spend on heating your home as a percentage of your income. Um, so from the point of view of people on low incomes, Heating your home is a great worry during the winter months. We hear stories of people having to choose between eating and heating their homes. Um, and particularly in Eastern and Southern Europe, it's a problem. So from a European Union point of view, um, if we make our homes better insulated, not only will we reduce emissions because we will be using less energy and the majority of that energy is still coming from fossil fuels. So that's the big win from a climate change point of view. Um, but it's also the case that there would be some big wins to be had for those people um, who are on uh, low incomes. Um, and how do we do it? Well, we do it in ways which we're very familiar with. We insulate lofts, we put in double glazing, which could have wooden window frames. We improve the quality of the doors, which could be made of wood, and we can put in wooden flooring. Um, and when you look at these two pictures, you probably find the picture on the uh, right reasonably exciting. That's the picture of a new wooden building um, in Sweden, the Culture House in Skelefto. And that's all very exciting, building new with wood. 
And on the left, you've got loft insulation. And loft insulation is a pretty dull subject. Um, but when it comes to the renovation wave, it's the dull materials on the left that are going to get us the big wins. So while uh, there's a role for wood in construction of new buildings, there's also um, in many ways an equally big role for wood-based products in the built environment in relation to renovation. So while we can store more carbon in new wooden buildings, which is great, and there's quite a lot of academic work being done on that as to the potential of a carbon sink in the built environment through using wood in construction for new build, there's probably an equally big carbon sink to be achieved by putting wood-based products into the built environment in relation to renovation and retrofitting the existing housing stock. And the European Commission, the European Union intends to um, have 35 million homes across Europe insulated with wood-based product, oh, sorry, insulated to a higher degree in the next 10 years. And if we were to use wood-based products, then we would greatly increase the global carbon sink um, or the carbon sink of the built environment. And lots of research on how we can move wood from the forest into the, into the built environment. And a good slogan here is reforest our planet reforest our cities, retimber our cities. And one of the options here is to build on top because wood is a light material. So existing buildings could have three, four, five stories of wood added on top um, as one of the ways in which we can renovate and retrofit our existing housing stock. And then just to finish, which is um, just a short uh, subject, but nonetheless an important one, is the new European bar house arrived unexpectedly um, in the world of Brussels um, in the president's speech to the parliament um, back in September of 2020. There'd been no um, forewarning of it. Uh, she stood up, President von der Leyen addressed the parliament and one of the things she talked about was a new European bar house. Now, uh, the original bar house was in 1920s Germany um, it was about architecture, art, design, beauty, practicality, and quickly became an international movement, but unfortunately was banned by the Nazis um, when they came to power. And Ursula von der Leyen would like to uh, resuscitate the idea of the Bauhaus and give it um, some new meaning in the new context of tackling climate change. And um, some slightly boring slides, but I think it's just worth quickly looking at what she said. We know that the construction sector can be turned from a carbon source into a carbon sink if organic building materials like wood are applied. Now that's coming from the very top of the commission. That's coming from the president of the commission. And we were absolutely delighted in the world of wood when we heard that. And it's I think, worth recognizing that because this Bauhaus initiative comes from the very top, it's unlikely to fail. And we need to be part of it. We need to work with it. And she went on to say, I want the next generation EU to kickstart a European renovation wave and make our union a leader in the circular economy. Now, we can help deliver that without any shadow of a doubt. But this is not just an environmental or an economic project. It needs to be a new cultural project for Europe. That's why I'll set up a new European Bauhaus co-creation space where architects, artists, scientists, engineers, students can work together to make it happen. We need to be part of this. We mustn't miss the boat. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be sustainable. It's going to be affordable. And wood can deliver on all of that. Wood's beautiful. No one ever told me that wood wasn't beautiful. It's sustainable as long as we use managed forests. And it's affordable. Um, particularly the prefabrication can make the opportunities that come from the world of wood affordable. We can't have a situation where we have beautiful buildings um, made from sustainable wood, but no one can afford them. But these buildings can be afforded, especially if they're prefabricated off-site. So just to conclude, um, my thrust of my argument and my suggestion to you is wherever possible, work with the proposals that are coming from the European Union, such as the Green Deal, the Renovation Wave and the Bauhaus. There are others as well, because this will help us deliver what we want to deliver, where the future will be bright and the future will be wooden. Thanks very much.